Hello, and welcome to season two of Conversations on Climate, in which I've been leading a series of conversations with experts from around the world exploring the biggest challenge of our time, climate change. Well, thank you also um, to Trinity College Dublin for you know, welcoming us all in here. It's a wonderful venue. Um, I, I'm back after 24 years after graduation. It's time absolutely flies, but it's great. And uh, thank you, Stephen and the team, for putting on this, uh, this wonderful event. Um, it's an opportunity for collaboration, knowledge sharing, raising awareness and growing our own ecosystems. It's a big, big, big theme of today's ecosystems. We're all developing our own ecosystems uh, in, the, in this space. As uh, Stephen mentioned, I, my name is Chris Caldwell. I'm a clean tech investor, renewables entrepreneur, and uh, podcast host. Okay, we all live in a tension economy, and as a podcast host, I know this all too well. It's a world obsessed with uh, subscribers, views, downloads, engagement. And this is increasingly true across business and academia. Uh, trouble is, the amount of information in the world is increasing exponentially. And our focus is a finite resource. Like, for example, every day, 10,000 new books are published. Like, how on earth are we supposed to stay on top of that pile? It's simply too much to pay attention to. So when a single issue breaks through into the collective consciousness these days, it's even more remarkable. And 2023 was the year where the world woke up to AI. ChatGPT and the like have absolutely dominated the cultural conversation in the last 12 months. And we're not just talking about it. We're arguing about it. We're worrying about it. This is uh, Stanford's AI index. And uh, if you see the guys on top, it's the NLP community. The NLP community are the natural language programmers. So these are the guys and girls who are writing the code. And this messaging from a, a, a conversation with these guys says that AI is something, one, we should be worried about, because they're worried about it. Two, it is uh, something that, just trying to look down at, Recent progress in moving us towards age AGI, which is art, um, artificial general intelligence, essentially sentient machines. So we're going towards there. If AI continues along this path, it will transform the way um, society works. That's 73% uh, believes that, so that's pretty strong. And the last one is really interesting. I think if we do end up going down the path that they believe we are on, there's a 36% of 36% of the people who are working on it believe that this could cause a nuclear level catastrophe. So this is a, not, a pretty material like, set, of, set of thought processes from the people who are developing these. Now, uh, if I was working on something that I thought had a 36% chance of destroying the world, I'd probably find something else to do. But um, here's another example. Uh, this, is, this guy is the so-called godfather of AI. His name is Jeffrey Hinton. And uh, he says that he believes AI is more of a threat than climate change. I'm not entirely sure that's, that's fair, that's right. I'm not entirely sure it's a uh, competition. But then again, uh, climate change was the other great breakthrough in public attention that we've had over recent years. But with climate, as uh, Thomas de Martin was saying, we are making good progress. There's a lot of work to do, and we're running out of time, but we are heading in the right direction. And that's credit to everybody here at this summit who's working so hard to, to raise awareness for, for so long. I'm very pleased to say that Trinity College is already working on these themes in earnest. In fact, if any of, any of you wanted to stay around for one more day, th here's the college event calendar for tomorrow. Couldn't resist this uh, perfect calendar clash. Now, it says, if you're interested in one thing, which is ethical AI, you literally cannot go to the Nature Connection Workshop, they're on at the same time. It's a problem of attention. Uh, and this is, the, this is the paradox that we're all facing, that in a world that's growing ever more complex and yet more demanding of, of our concern and our, th our thought processes, we're struggling with this paradox of attention. And in this talk, I'm going to pick through this tricky relationship between climate and AI by thinking about this puzzle. To start with, we'll look at some of the ways AI is helping us. It's accelerating our ability to decarbonize. Then we'll look at the big risks for the planet associated with AI and how the struggle for attention underlies all this. And finally, we'll look at the question of what the response sustainable AI demands of us. So we'll start out optimistically. AI as our hopeful and helpful att um, attendant. 
AI promises to supercharge our efforts to apply technology to, to decarbonize. Models have an incredible ability to pay attention to outrageous amounts of data, and boy, do we need their help. Today, we're drowning in data. The world produces about three and a half quintillion bytes every day. Now, I'm not entirely even sure what a quintillion is, but I do know if it's a number that sounds like it's made up by a six-year-old, it's going to be pretty big. Um, every day, we recognize that more and more data is relevant uh, to, cli to climate change, be it for weather, be it market prices, be it smart grids, be it the um, internet of everything in, inside our households. But as we've been saying for a long time, this is an action problem, it's not an information problem. So rather than simply drown in more data, the question is how can we turn the fire hose of information around and point it towards the, the climate fire? Here's some examples of how AI is making that possible. Start with these guys. So we know we all want batteries uh, for electric vehicles. We know their, their importance and we know that they, are, they need to be ubiquitous. Problem is, fast charging batteries usually don't, la don't last very long. Um, and we, have, we need something that charges quickly that also lasts for, lasts for a long time. It's too, uh, too important and expensive a component part of an EV for it to do anything else. The problem is it takes about two years to be testing batteries. Now these guys, a Stanford te team of um, engineers uh, worked with Toyota uh, to try and reduce the production process for, uh, for the testing process for uh, batteries. And so they successfully took it from two years to 16 days. And they did this by, by understanding that the uh, AI is better than humans and knowing what variables are worth paying attention to. So the AI found better paths through, uh, throughout the trial and error process. This breakthrough isn't just limited to batteries. We need to redesign a host of whole new technologies for net zero. Time isn't a luxury that we have, so like, AI will, be, will very much help us with this. So one more quick example. Uh, this, one's, this one's really cool. Uh, we know that deforestation is a major issue, particularly in the Amazon. Um, it poses terrible, terrible risks for us, for it, uh, in climate, in biodiversity, environmental justice, and much else beside. We spent decades and decades trying to stop it. The trouble is, the Amazon is absolutely vast. Uh, local communities and um, local land defenders have been trying to prevent deforestation for decades, but they need our help. Sadly, by the time the authorities turn up, you know, normally the, tree, the trees are already gone. So, this uh, startup, um, Previsia, has taken um, satellite data from the European Space Agency and uses it to predict where deforestation will happen. Like, how do they do this? Well, they figured out that most deforestation happens within a close proximity to a road. Now, the issue is we didn't really know where the roads were. Most were, were illegal and most were, were, uh, were not on maps. So, using the satellite imagery, they went through it found out what all the roads were. Then they matched it with natural topography and population de density uh, questions and dozens of other variables and they used to predict the likely illegal de deforestation hotspots. And they've been super successful. 85% of their AI alerts are proven to be accurate within four kilometers and that gives people a massive, massive head start to get in there and to stop these guys before they uh, take down the forests. Now, that's the positive side. Now, on the downside, what we're not paying attention to the bad news. Yes, AI can do the work of thousands of people, but it is still work. And all work costs energy. The problem is that that is, is invisible. It's up there in the clouds. And because we can't see the work going on, we assume that there's no material footprints. It's a, again, it's another problem of attention. And sadly, the environmental of impact, impact of AI is very real. If we can put a few numbers on us, so go, go back to this uh, Stanford report. I'm sure everyone in this room has played with ChatGPT. It's a fantastic tool. Uh, but the training of just a single instance of ChatGPT3 emits 500 tons of carbon. Now, that is more than the average person uh, emits in their entire life. Now, a defender of AI might just say, aha, what about this guy? This is Gordon Moore. And I'm sure a lot of us will have heard of Moore's Law. Uh, it came from uh, semiconductors, which said that as technology advances, it'll become ever more efficient over time. Now, can't help but to notice he's using a pen, but you know, that aside, it should be you know, problem solved, right? So, you know, all we need to do is keep on building it and become more efficient, and, and, and it will cause no more strains in our, uh, on our systems. But uh, we climate folks have our own uh, guide to say aha to you with. This is uh, one of the fathers of Western environmental uh, economics, uh, William Stanley Jevons. 
Um, he came up with the Jevons paradox, also known as the rebound effect, which suggests that something, as something becomes more efficient, it becomes cheaper. And as it becomes cheaper, we use more of it. Demanding demand increases. So the first computer, for instance, uh, fit the size, the size of an entire room. Now we can get them into little, little nanos you can inject in a human's body. The result is a radical increase in the amount of computing power that, that we've used because we can much more efficient at it. Data production is doubling every two years. Now, I don't know what happens after a quintillion, but we're going to find out quite soon. The internet already accounts for somewhere between 2 and 4% of global, global carbon emissions. And by 2030, some studies suggest it might be as, as high as 30%. That takes it from being the equivalent of the fifth largest economy today, which is Japan, to being the equivalent of the third largest, largest economy today, which is India. It's huge. So with machine learning, as it becomes more efficient, we'll just use more of it. We'll put it in more places and we'll train it on even larger data sets. Yeah. And all that computation, it costs carbon. If there's a, an indication that there's truly a magazine for everything today, here we have Data Center Weekly. <laughs> We're very aware in Ireland of the, the increasing proliferation of data and energy requirements. You may have seen that uh, Ireland's 75 data centers use up nearly a fifth of the total electricity for the country. That's a that is a fourfold increase in less than a decade. And there's another 38 in planning or, or under construction. How are we going to meet our climate targets while also sticking AI, AI in every um, corner of the economy with this level of proliferation? Now, we could take the tried and tested developed world, develop world's paths of uh, offshoring data centers to Asia, um, excluding them from our own, from our own carbon uh, figures, and then carrying on blaming the climate problem on Asia. But you know, clearly, that's just another way of us avoiding attention. The real solution has to go deeper. We can't just ban new data centers, as has been, been suggested. Um, but to, so to solve a problem of attention, we need policy that takes the invisible and makes it visible again. Happy Halloween. This brings us back to our old friend, proper carbon pricing. Putting a, a genuine price tag on the emissions produced by data uh, will reveal the true cost of machine learning and the visible impact. It's an essential first step. But unfortunately, even that won't guarantee AI will be a net positive on the planet. Unfortunately, AI, as with so many things in the world, it just follows the money. And in the market economy, it's a pretty good leading indicator of what society chooses to value. And here, we're seeing private, private firms absolutely taking over the AI space. 32 from industry and the rest, tiny, fraction for academia and um, you know, non-industrial non uh, partners. Now, this is, the, this is the dark side of that trend. Um, oil and gas firms spent two and a half billion dollars on AI in 2020. And that's estimated to grow to 15 um, billion dollars by the end of the decade. And that's because AI can be used to efficiently uh, find and extract carbon. Now, that will boost production, it's expected, by as much as 5%. We're supposed to be turning this trend around. This is AI is going to be used to be um, increasing our uh, carbon footprint rather than reducing it. This is only possible because we keep on you know, providing oil and gas firms a social license and underpinning it with huge profits. That's another conversation. But to, to truly ensure that AI becomes a force for good, we need to rethink what we value as society. After all, the algorithm can only turn its computational gaze to the questions that we ask it. So that brings us to the final paradox of AI. And this, this is the most dangerous, if we think about it. Humanity has got a very long history of looking for a savior, and climate change is no different. We can see this most clearly and most dangerously in the idea of the technofix, the idea that we'll invent something to magically solve all of our problems tomorrow. It might be fusion, it might be geoengineering, it might be colonizing Mars. Whatever the flavor of tax effects is, uh, it's just another way of, look, of, of looking away, of diverting our attention. We don't need to think about this because the future will solve itself. And that's particularly ironic in, the, in the, the case of AI, which can only be trained on the past. And the last time I checked, the last 100 years, we haven't been doing a particularly good job on sustainability. Like, is this really what we want to be replicating, making better with, through the stochastic parrots of, of machine learning? Probably not. So, in conclusion, AI was neither our savior nor it's our destroyer. It's simply a mirror that we hold up to ourselves. Its judgments can only be based on the data it's trained on. 
and the, and the data, and the more we feed into it, the more the data matches the aggregate values of our society. And as such, it can only reflect rather than determine our, our environmental realities. So the final question remains, what do we value? Even the most hardened fan of AI can't suggest that this is a question that a machine can answer for us. It's up to humanity to decide. And it's the question our climate future rests upon. So we'd better pay it a bit more attention.